Welcome back, or welcome to the Tammy Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II, and in today's podcast, I'd like to introduce a new segment called Speakable. Think of Speakable as an audiobook for content, be it articles or blog posts, that relate to the art, science, and history of neon and plasma. This was largely inspired by my love for audiobooks and the podcast Optimal Living Daily, that is centered around narration of articles and blog posts, with given permissions. So I thought I'd give it a shot to help fill the gaps between the interviews and discussions that are being scheduled in, to be able to give new life to content that I bring to you. Let me know in the comments or by email your thoughts on continuing this and suggested materials are welcome. The intro is Boost by Joachim Krud. Joachim is a Swedish artist who loves to produce chill and happy music and does so for copyright free use. Be sure to support his music by giving credit when used subscribing, and or by donation. You can find them on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Before I begin, I want to talk about the organization behind the source material, the Chemical Heritage Foundation, which is a library, a center for scholars, a museum, and an archive. They focus on matter and materials and their effects on our modern world. They collect, preserve, and exhibit historical artifacts, engage communities of scientists and engineers, and tell the stories of people behind breakthroughs and innovations. Distillations is a blog, podcast, and magazine centered around science, culture, and history, where you'll find a diverse range of subjects such as science, business, technology, and pop culture. Please check it out at chemheritage.org or in the link listed in the blog post. In our first speakable, I'll be reading A Blaze of Crimson Light, The Story of Neon, by Jane E. Boyd and Joseph Rucker, an article relating to a brief history and science of neon in terms of its discovery, uses, and its associations with sign-making and advertising. A Blaze of Crimson Light, The Story of Neon Neon is a dull and invisible gas until trapped in a tube and zapped with electricity. Literally pulled out of thin air, Neon became the bright light of the modern world, a symbol of progress, and an essential component of the electronic age. I smelled Los Angeles before I got to it. It smelled stale and old, like a living room that had been closed too long. But the colored lights fooled you. The lights were wonderful. There ought to be a monument to the man who invented neon lights. Fifteen stories high, solid marble. There's a boy who really made something out of nothing. Raymond Chandler. The Little Sister, 1949. Philip Marlowe, the hard-boiled hero of Raymond Chandler's detective novels, would write about neon. The inventors of the lights that set the night sky aglow in a thousand cities literally had made something out of nothing. The colorful words and pictures came from the air itself. Mysterious gases extracted from the atmosphere, trapped in glass tubes and zapped with electric current to create a luminous reaction. During the 20th century, lights fueled by neon and its fellow noble gases were icons of commerce and entertainment, illuminating the modern age. Some early computers and calculators even used small neon tubes for circuits and displays. Today, many of the large, elaborate neon signs have sputtered out, replaced by newer or cheaper technologies, but these gas-filled tubes still shine on a smaller scale, treasured for their unique light. Aristocrats of the Air The story of neon begins in the 1890s with the Scottish chemist Sir William Ramsey, best known as the co-discoverer of four of the noble gases, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. Ramsey also isolated and characterized helium and radon, the other two noble gases, winning the Nobel Prize for his efforts. Together, these six gases form a family of elements distinguished by their unwillingness to bond with other atoms. The standoffish nobility gave the noble gases their name. It was a long time before the atmosphere gave up all its secrets. As early as 1785, prominent chemist Henry Cavendish had noted a small residue of gas left over when he removed oxygen, then known as deflagricated air, 
and what we know now as nitrogen from common air. Ramsey and his mentor, John William Strutt, 3rd Baron Rayleigh, took upon the challenge of identifying this mystery gas. In 1894, they began attacking air with brute force methods, combustion, reaction, and absorption, to strip away every possible atom of nitrogen and oxygen. In one early ex experiment, they removed oxygen from air using red-hot copper. To remove nitrogen, they deoxygenated air was passed over red-hot magnesium, soda lime, copper oxide, and phosphoric anhydride. After further steps eliminated the remaining nitrogen and oxygen, they named the residual gas argon, derived from the Greek, the inactive or lazy one. The argon makes up less than 1% of the atmosphere. Ramsey suspected that there were even rarer gases hidden in the air. In the summer of 1898, he and his colleague Morris W. Travers hunted down these additional elements. Starting with purified argon liquefied at low temperatures, they slowly added heat to isolate the gases that boiled at temperatures both above and below argon's boiling point. In this way, they discovered neon, krypton, and xenon, Greek for the new one, the hidden one, and the stranger. Though these rare gases are invisible to the naked eye, each one glows with a distinctive brilliant color when sealed in a glass tube and energized with high voltage. These gas discharge tubes, named for the electrical discharge that make them light up, would become the basis for neon lamps. Ramsey found neon lights particularly striking. In his 1904 Nobel Prize lecture, he described the neon spectrum as a brilliant flame-colored light, consisting of many red, orange, and yellow lines. Travers was even more effusive. The blaze of crimson light from the tube told us its own story, and it was a sight to dwell upon and never to forget. It was worth the struggle of the previous two years, and all the difficulties yet to be overcome before the research was finished, for nothing in the world gave a glow such as we had seen. Mining the Air Beginning in the late 19th century, liquid air, particularly oxygen, found many uses, including in theater lighting and industrial welding. All techniques for liquefying gases use the Joule-Thompson effect, seen in the home or office today whenever a can of pressurized air is used to dust a computer keyboard. As the air expands to the nozzle, the temperature drops and condensation forms on the can. The first practical methods to liquefy air on a large scale appeared while Ramsey was working in isolating his gases, and he made sure to thank William Hampson, one of the men responsible in his Nobel Prize lecture. Like Hampson in England, Carl von Lind in Germany, and others, the Parisian electrical engineer and inventor George Claude applied the Joule Thompson effect to liquefying air scaling up the process to produce huge quantities, up to 10,000 cubic meters per day. With his formal schoolmate and colleague Paul Delorme, he formed a company in 1902 named simply Lierre Liquid that expanded rapidly to become an international corporation. While selling liquid oxygen for industrial purposes, Claude carried out scientific research. At first, he had hoped to discover additional noble gases by analyzing large volumes of liquefied air, but he was forced to admit that, after Ramsey, there was nothing more to be done. His next project combined the leftover neon from his liquefaction of air with his dislike of the overwhelming brightness of electrical lighting at the time. Lines of Light Claude was not the first to look to gas tubes for light. Spurned by the commercial success of Thomas Edison's incandescent light bulbs, Inventors attempted to transform gas discharge tubes into practical lighting systems. In the late 1890s, Daniel McFarlane Moore, a formal Edison employee, filled 10-foot glass tubes with nitrogen or carbon dioxide under low pressure, adding electrodes at both ends. These Moore lamps, which glowed a bright white when electrified, were more efficient than carbon filament incandescent lamps then in use. Though the lamps were used as general lighting in some stores and workplaces, they were expensive to install. A glass plumber had to connect the tubes on site. They required high voltage electricity and tended to leak. After 1910, when improved incandescent lamps 
with tungsten filaments displaced Moore's tubes, his company went under. Claude soon found that adapting Moore's concept to neon involved more than just switching gases. His tubes gave a magnificent glow, but impurity set free from the hot electrodes quickly dimmed the brightness. A carbon filter solved that problem, but not the issue of metallic buildup around the electrodes, which made the tubes flicker out too soon. Claude installed larger electrodes that stayed cooler. The resulting tubes burned brightly and steadily, with 20-foot tubes lasting as long as 1,200 hours. Successful at last, Claude filed his first patent for neon lighting in 1910. That December, he demonstrated his invention at the Salon de l'Automobile, the Paris Motor Show. Inside the exhibition building, thousands of incandescent bulbs, studded light fixtures, and manufacturer signs glinted off the shiny metal of the cars below. Outside, two 40-foot neon tubes glowed a vivid orange-red on the building's colonnade. Modern technology of all sorts was on display. The newest cars and the newest lighting made possible by electrical network, then spreading rapidly throughout Paris. Claude admitted that the red neon was not ideal for general lighting, but insisted there were some situations in which neon would prove superior, such as for illuminating monuments and in advertising, where the more dazzling and attractive a light, the more suitable it is. This last use turned out to be the most popular. In 1912, Claude installed the first ever neon advertising sign in a Parisian barbershop on the Boulevard Mamarche. A large rooftop sign for the Italian vermouth maker Cenzano soon followed, along with illumination for the entrance of the Paris Opera. Making the most of his new invention, Claude formed another company, Claude Neon, to sell franchises for neon signage. Despite a high price tag, a whopping $100,000 plus royalties, dozens of franchises opened up around the world, especially in the major American cities. Neon was on its way to becoming a household name. Though the earliest neon signs were relatively simple, the range of colors and animation would come later. Business owners competed with each other to trace their signatures on buildings and rooftops. Claude's signage monopoly lasted through the 1920s, eventually crumbling as his patents expired and former employees leaked his trade secrets. A New Sign Language The first neon signs in the United States did not appear in New York or Las Vegas which had a population of just a few thousand people in the early 1920s, but in the boom town of Los Angeles. Entrepreneur Earl C. Anthony was a pioneer in several modern businesses, notably radio, automobiles, and gas stations. In 1915, he founded the first California dealership for Packard Motor Car Company, a luxury brand, and remained a sole Packard distributor in the state through the 1950s. Anthony saw Claude's neon signs on a visit to Paris and in 1923 commissioned a stylish promotion for his downtown showroom. Two signs, each with Packard in an elegant script, traced in orange neon tubing with a clear blue border, most likely produced by adding mercury to the neon. The signs cost $1,250, about half of the price of a 1923 five-passenger Packard single six touring car but Anthony's investment paid off. The signs were a sensation, reportedly causing traffic jams as people stopped to marvel at their intense glow. From that point on, neon was unstoppable. It truly was the new one, a symbol of modern industry, commerce, and progress in a world still recovering from the traumas of World War I and the effects of the Great Depression. In New York and London, in Denver and Shanghai, Along the main streets of the world, dust brings forth a million vivid electric signs that make the night alive. There is a new sign language, written in glass, proclaimed a 1937 advertisement for Corning Glassworks, which supplied tubes for neon signs. Claude's use of neon in the Paris Motor Show was perhaps prophetic, since neon soon became an integral part of the automobile culture, particularly in the United States. As the American interstate highway system developed, Neon signs across the country promoted businesses that catered to motorists, gas stations, diners, motels, and roadside attractions. And in New York, Los Angeles, and especially Las Vegas became famous for the countless neon signs that enticed people with visions of nighttime pleasures, both accepted and forbidden.
going to the movies or the theater, dining in the restaurants, dancing, drinking, gambling, and sex. Many people learn how to make neon signs by working with established sign makers, but a few trade schools, notably the Igani Neon Glass Blowing School in New York City, also taught the painstaking technique. Working from a design traced on asbestos sheet, the sign maker heated a glass tube over a burner or in a torch to create bends and curves, blowing frequently through the hot tube to keep it from collapsing. Further steps included attaching electrodes to the tube, evacuating the air inside, and bombarding the interior with high voltage to clean the glass. After small amounts of gla gases were pumped in, usually a neon-argon mixture, sometimes with a little mercury, and the tube was sealed. It was aged with electrical current to remove impurities from the gas and to ensure a steady luminosity. The completed tubes were then mounted on a metal supporting plate, which was often coated in enamel for durability and to enhance the light from the tubes. Once the electrical apparatus was added, the sign was complete. Adjusting the gas mixtures and tinting or coating the tubes allowed for more than 40 different color combinations. Even with the limitations opposed by its fragile and difficult medium, many forms and shapes were possible. Block letters, flowing cursive script, combinations of line and geometric designs, and pictures of all sorts, from the humble shoe or fish in the shop window to the elaborate and large-scale moving signs aptly called spectaculars, animated by complex timing devices that turn tubes on and off in succession. These signs dazzled onlookers with outlines of speeding trains, gigantic dancing showgirls, or drinks pouring into immense glasses. Spectaculars were masterpieces of art and technology, requiring hundreds of feet of tubing and miles of electrical wiring. Counting on Neon Neon didn't just glow in signs. At the dawn of the computer age in the 1950s and 1960s, neon tubes were key components of some digital circuits. This unusual application was possible because of the way electricity functions in neon tubes. Electrons flow through the tube only when it is lit. The voltage needed to light a neon tube is higher than that needed to keep it on. By maintaining a tube at a high voltage somewhere between on and off, small increases or decreases in voltage could be used to control the current, seen as light. Precise regulation of flow of current allowed the tube to be used as a binary switch to control digital circuits. These neon switches could be linked up to create circuits needed for a range of applications, from the simple arithmetic of accounting to the measurement of events that occur faster than humans can count, such as in radioactive decay. Glow lamps filled with airco neon help computers think faster, a 1961 magazine advertisement explained. Without the neon glow lamp, the dazzling speed, compactness, and economy of electronic computer would not be possible, and many of the spectacular advances that are now being made in business and defense technologies would be slowed down considerably. Neon tubes had another advantage for computers and technical equipment. Since they ran cooler and more efficiently than incandescent bulbs, they could be used as indicator lights and displays. Common types of neon display was a Nixie tube, short for Numeric Indicator Experimental Number 1 introduced in 1955. This small neon bulb had wires shaped like numerals, letters, and other symbols, one in front of the other, that lit up when the current was turned on. Neon's biggest electronic triumph may have been the world's first electronic desktop calculators, the Anita MK7 and MK8, invented by Norbert Kitts of Bell Punch Company in England. The Anita machines, whose name was an acronym for a new inspiration to arithmetic or accounting, had a Nixie tube-like display. An advertisement highlighted this feature. Answers are recorded in large lit-up figures, which defy you to misread them. Inside Anita's, neon-filled switching tubes drove calculating logic. Introduced in 1961 and 62, at the cost of 355 pounds sterling, about 1,000 at the time, or 7,500 today, Anita sold at the rate of 10,000 per year to such businesses as banks, accounting firms, and department stores. With a footprint about 1 by 1.5 feet, that's 31 centimeters by 46 centimeters, and a weight over 30 pounds, that's 14 kilograms each. Anita calculators were large by modern standards. They were, however, quieter and faster than early mechanical calculators. 
and much smaller and cheaper than huge and hugely expensive computers of the day, as 1965 article explained. The tubes are the accountant's dream. A typical modern tube has a life expectancy several thousand times better than the conventional thermionic vacuum tube. Although they employ voltages of the same order, they are much cheaper than either semiconductor devices or vacuum tubes. They do not require costly materials with high degree of purity in their manufacture, nor do they need transformers or cooling systems to operate. By the 1970s, neon tubes and computers were largely obsolete. Transistors became a preferred electronic switching element, and light-emitting diodes, LEDs, began to replace Nixie tubes in displays. Neon, however, still glows brightly in the do-it-yourself electronics. Today, avid hobbyists seek out vintage Nixie tubes for hand-built clocks and occasional eye-catching wristwatches, and some even created retro-style neon circuits. Neon Old and New Neon Supreme reign and signage was also relatively brief. Nighttime blackouts during World War II darkened neon signs around the United States, and many large ones were never relit. Cheaper, low-maintenance signs made possible by new kinds of plastics and fluorescent tubes replaced them. Defunct neon signs considered eyesores in many municipalities were scrapped, though dedicated collectors and preservationists fought to preserve and restore these pieces of genuine Americana. Nowadays, most neon signs are small and simple, such as open signs for stores or beers advertisements for bars. The late 1970s, however, saw small beginnings of a small-scale neon revival that is still ongoing. Attracted by neon's unique look and retro appeal, sign makers bent tubes for signs in old and new styles, passing on their skills to a new generation. Architects used neon to accent buildings inside and out, and artists pushed the medium in new directions, drawing with light to create unique abstract sculptures. Even if giant television screens and lighted billboards have replaced the extravagant neon spectaculars of old in New York City's Times Square and elsewhere, neon still illuminates the night in cities and towns worldwide, from Las Vegas to Tokyo and beyond. And what are the first neon signs in the United States? Packard cars are long gone, but Earl C. Anthony's showroom remains standing in downtown Los Angeles. Over the entrance, a replica neon sign advertises the building's new function in a brilliant blue-white glow, Packard Lofts. Xenon freezes the moment. All the noble gases produce striking illumination, but xenon played an important role in the development of high-speed or flash photography, improving on the chemical flashes and electric spark of photography's early days. Xenon-filled tubes produce brief, intense bursts of light that can freeze motion on film. Harold Egerton, a professor of electrical engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, originated high-speed photography using many kinds of flash technology, including strobe lamps. One of the most iconic images shows a crown-shaped milk droplet captured in mid-splash. His first flash lamps used mercury or argon, but Egerton switched to xenon in the 1940s. Xenon flash tubes were an excellent choice, particularly for the color photography. Unlike neon's blazing red or argon's purple, xenon's glow is a discharge tube is similar to sunlight, enabling photographers to better capture natural color indoors. The original xenon flash tubes and associated electronic developed in the 1940s were too cumbersome for anyone but professional photographers to use. But in the 1970s, however, miniaturized xenon flash tubes were small enough to become standard feature on regular cameras. While light-emitting diodes, LEDs, are now often used as flashes in cell phone cameras and other digital cameras, many cameras, particularly high-speed ones, still take advantage of intensity and natural color of xenon light. So next time someone takes your picture with a flash, think of xenon and smile. The outro is Reentry by Laps. Laps is a Chicago based artist whose music can only be described as a remedy for time consisting of motion and sound. If you give his music a listen, you'll understand what exactly that means. 
You could check out his music on Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Bandcamp. Thank you for listening to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the first segment of Speakable. If you find something interesting that you would like to have narrated, please send me an email or Facebook message at Taming Lightning. I'd like to thank Michael Mayer, the Editor-in-Chief of Distillations at the Chemical Heritage Foundation for permission to narrate their article from their magazine. Also, I'd like to thank Pittsburgh Glass Center for supporting me as well as encouraging me to pursue this project, as well as the Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge and connects me to some amazing people. Keep an eye out for next summer's classes at Pittsburgh Glass Center as we work to provide a space for learning neon and plasma. In the spring, I'll be teaching a two-night hands-on workshop for creating plasma globes. On the first night, you'll be working with me to create your globe by adding color, pushing, and pulling the glass. On the second night, you'll see your piece filled with neon gases and light up before your eyes. This class does not require any glass experience and mostly geared toward those who are local to Pittsburgh. For those with more glass experience, you may contact me to help you get started, but also keep a lookout for our five-day summer intensives, especially with Wayne Strapman and Mundy Hepburn doing Plasma Neon in the Flame Studio. If you'd like to support this, simply go to PercyEccles.com and look for the tab Taming Lightning, or by typing in TamingLightning.net and click subscribe. Later, there will probably be other options in the future. But for now, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.